This conference will now be recorded. I'd like to call the April 12th, 2021 work session to order at 6 p.m. Are there any additions or removal of agenda items tonight? If not, would anyone so move to accept the agenda tonight? I make a motion that we uh, accept the agenda for this special session. <clears throat> so moved. Is there a second? I'll second. Thank you, Councilor uh, Webb. Uh, would you call the roll, please, Stephanie? Councilor Allen? Aye. Councilor Williams? Aye. Councilor Webb? Aye. Mayor Hobart? Aye. Councilor Potter is absent. Motion carried. Thank you, Stephanie. Move right into new business. Discussion, sidewalks, improvements. Has everyone received a packet to go over um, before this session tonight? Yes. A lot of material in there, but. Wow. But um, I'll just uh, turn it over to uh, staff and, and uh, we have a, the city engineer, Robert, with us tonight to answer questions. So welcome, Robert. So with that being said, I'll turn it over to staff. Can't hear either Stephanie or Josette. No. Now can you hear me? Now can, yep. So we had the on-site meeting um, where we a lot of questions came up. So in your packet, we included the answers to those questions to the best of our ability, the options in front of you. Robert did an awesome report that lays out um, what the different options are. And then Stephanie did a whole bunch of background work on what other communities are doing um, from kind of pulling her counterpart. Um, so really it's just up to you guys to discuss, ask questions and come up with a direction you want staff to go as far as it pertains to the waivers of remonstrance. Is it, do we do them? We don't do them. We do a fee in lieu. We make them do it all. What do you, what, it's up to you guys to discuss that and come up with it. <laughs> Go ahead, JR. You want me to start? So I read I read the report, some good information in there. Thank you for everybody for that. Um, my thought on as I read through this was I out of all the options on there kind of struck me as just slice it down and say you're gonna you put a house in, you're putting your sidewalks in. I don't know about the curbs. I have reservations about our staffing been able to handle any other option besides you put a house in, you're putting in your stuff, period. Um, Josette can speak a little more on that probably later. I uh, don't like the fee in lieu particularly. It is an option, but uh, as the report stated in there, there's several nightmare situations with that. Uh, Costs going up, keeping track of it all. 10, 20 years down the line, sending engineers around and stuff to try to keep track of who's what and multiple different sales of people like we've all talked about. So um, that's kind of where I am right now. It's I'm more leaning on to if we want to do it, we just say well, you're going to do it from now on. And um, there could be situations where we say you're going to do it, but we're going to give you a year because we got some work in this area or something like that. Maybe I don't know. That. But uh, as I read through it, that's kind of what jumped out at me. I'll let you guys uh, weigh in on it, and I'm willing to listen. Thank you, JR. <coughs> Go ahead, Dale. So, uh, yeah, that, I mean, that's definitely an option. Just rip the Band-Aid off and, and just require it. Uh, I guess that depends on what our vision is. If we're envisioning sidewalks on both sides of the streets, uh, um, that that look, 
one concern I have is I think somewhere in one of the examples they were talking about or I'd seen in the past, they do pathways uh, for connectivity of neighborhoods as a solution. Us requiring everybody to do that doesn't solve our issues of getting sidewalks to connect these neighborhoods. So say for Louisiana, we would have that fully developed out. We'd have a sidewalk along it and then it's just going to end, um, you know, unless we want to take city resources, but I don't know where we would get them other than more federal stimulus money here uh, to, to fund that. Uh, that's kind of where I envision the fee and lieu coming in. That would provide us a path for that connectivity. Uh, Louisiana, we could go down E Street, hook it up, do something on State Street to hook into a sidewalk. Uh, we could go down and hook the school up um, uh, and not have full sidewalks on, on both sides, of the, on, on all the streets up there. Maybe we only require a sidewalk on one side. But yet we're using those resources to connect that neighborhood. So those are the things that um, trouble me about just ripping the Band-Aid off and just require it. Um, personally, I think that's it's the simpler solution for us as a council, but I'm not sure it's I'm not sure it's going to meet our vision of what we really want to accomplish. So I'll let somebody else talk. Yeah, I, I, def I definitely hear that, Dale. But uh, as soon as you said that, I thought, well, why don't you cut me a check and I'll put a sidewalk in front of my house and let you sit at your house for 10 years and see how you feel about it. So I understand that connectivity thing. And maybe that becomes part of an, maybe we, maybe that's part of SDS fees or something for main thoroughfares. I don't know the answer to that, but uh, um, I'm trying to think of it as a citizen, new person to Vernonia, homeowner, old person to Vernonia, doesn't matter. You pay for something, you want it. You don't want it somewhere else, unless it's real clear. You're paying for something that we're gonna put on a street on the other side of town. Um, as far as the sidewalks to nowhere, well, once those fill in a little bit, pretty soon there is sidewalks to somewhere. And um, if there is a connectivity part, I think that's where some of these special grants or SDCs can come in as a city to connect that. And then those adjacent landowners, as the way I see it, can be charged for that. Um, Am I wrong about that, Josette? And we're froze up here again. Sorry, I I can't answer right now. I got a family thing. Hold on. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <clears throat> well, anyway, the, the way I see it, it uh, speaking to everybody here is it's a the more convoluted it gets it's more of a nightmare for staff so i'd really like to hear from staff and our public works we don't we don't have a public works director i've been told a hundred times and then it keeps referring to the public works director to do all this work and i'm worried about elevations i'm worried about engineering every time if we did rip the banding off band-aid off somebody says okay i'm putting in my sidewalk what, what's my elevation what do I go to? And does the city got to run out and survey every time? Do we have the money for that? Do we have the money to support whatever decision we make except for pay us now and we'll put something in later where we want? So that's kind of where I was thinking on it. Stephanie. I think Robert could probably address that to see how long it would take them to work on that because he's the one who does the purple. I sent it to him, but he does the permitting for all the grading and erosion sidewalks, driveways for all new houses. So he could say if it, how difficult it is, how long it would take him ish, you know, rough estimates. So he could probably answer that question for you better than anybody else could. Okay. 
Robert, let's just say I wanted to build a house up on, what is that, 6th Street on uh, on the other side of uh, Nehalem there, where it's kind of like a half road gravel. Kind of runs down there a, few, a block or two in dead ends. And then I'm going to come to you for elevations and everything. How long is it going to take you and what's going to cost the city? Or are you going to charge the homeowner? Are you only going to do 150 feet of a whole street that's not really put in properly? How would that go about it? You'd have to survey it. You'd have to have an elevation plan for the whole section, right? I mean, that'd be ideal. You need to know at what point you're going to connect back into the existing infrastructure, the existing sidewalk or pavement, whatever it's going to be. Um, it's really a case by case basis, depending on what needs to happen with that. The one thing I wanted to bring up, I heard two different things that you said. Um, to me, it sounded like your second opinion was to take the fee in lieu of to get the money and do all the engineering ourselves on the back end. Whereas you originally said just to have everybody put the sidewalks in themselves. Could you clarify on that? No, I wasn't talking about fee in lieu to put do any engineering. Um, I think that's going to have to fall on whoever wants to build the sidewalk, unfortunately. Right. But my question was, if I only own 150 feet or 100 feet of a section where there's really no road, and I'm coming to you for engineering, you're going to say, well, there's really no road here. There's kind of a gravel half road. What 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 does that entail from from you guys, and what does it cost? Basically, I know it's hard to say, but I'm I'm trying to think of. I mean, it means that you have to go back again as far back as possible to or as far back as necessary to tie into something existing and then just maybe guess at what's going to be in between that existing and what they're putting in for new stuff um, for me the idea of the time is as big a issue it's more of how much of that is actually going to be a guess and how much of that guess is going to be effective for whoever's in the middle and let's say there's not proper storm water and sewer in that road and maybe there's going to be some changes is that something that you can overlay with all of that type of civil engineering or do you handle all that stuff um we do all the civil engineering we do storm water uh, sewer systems pavement yeah. that's what i'm worried about if i rip the band-aid off so to speak all the support work it's going to take to make it done, make make it happen right for the for the builders or homeowners or whoever, so we don't end up with, well, so they just put a sidewalk at this elevation. That's kind of weird. Right. And does that on the back end mean that you have to do more more repair work or more work just to redo well, it, it? It could be either you're going to spend money up front or you're going to spend more money in the rear and. Um, the problem with fee and lieu is prices go up and and like it said in some of these reports you start dealing with city and then you start dealing with prevailing wage and you don't you're not going to get as much for your money so it's cheaper for the landowner to do it when they build um you got equipment there you someone could dig it out someone could form it and be done with it um now curb and gutter to me that's a separate issue then you could say we're doing sidewalks, but curb and gutter could come after we're done with the street assessments and stuff. But, and maybe some, if you got digging to do all over the street, but um, I think that's another issue. Is it curb and gutter and just sidewalk or is it all of it, you know, or can you make them put the sidewalk in, but the curb and gutter can be a fee. So, And now I'm Stephanie, talking about areas where there's no road, obviously. Stephanie. Robert, can you clarify, isn't the gutter underneath the sidewalk, so it would have to be done at the same time? I'm not positive, it's a question. It really depends on how the standard for engineering is put together. Um, Referring back to the documents that I put together, if that was adopted as the standard, you can have the stormwater going through the planter strip. Otherwise, if you just have 
an existing stormwater system, you usually have that running through, not exactly the middle, but through the middle of the road, roughly, alongside the sanitary sewer system. You could also have it under the side, but that's, I think, a little less official because you might need manholes to connect them to, which would go in the middle of the right way. Um, I guess I have a question. Um, if we took the bandaid off like um, JR was talking about and, and Dale was talking about, would that automatically trigger the, um, the waiver um, to be enforced then at that point or not? Like uh, it went trigger like on I Street, for example, with those people that are already there have to put in their sidewalks and move on that? No. No, council would have, to put, would have to make that decision on a block by block basis. Okay. Or a, help me with the word, the reimbursement? Local improvement district? Yeah. Reimbursement district. Yeah. Yeah. Councilor Williams. Well, I'm not really sure how to address the uh, paying for this part, but it seems to me just over the years watching development take place, <clears throat> a road is generally graded then a curve goes in before there's any paving or any sidewalk. If you start putting in sidewalks without curbs and general grading, I mean proper grading, somewhat near final grade, you're going to be tearing up sidewalks because you're going to, you're going to have places where you're going to have to fill in a lot. You're going to have places you got to dig out a lot. You're going to have problems with transitions between garages uh going across the sidewalk get, doing the curve getting to the street uh, uh where there's any kind of a slope at all I, I think up there on six where you were talking about it's not just flat up there i don't think and uh w without the general grade in the curb in i don't see how you can establish like concrete driveways i mean i think you got to start at the very basic and get that done get the grading and the curve in before you can talk about anything else. Am I wrong? Well, it depends on what kind of uh, construction you have, Grant. Some of that curb and sidewalk is connected. Now there's, and then if you have planter strips in between, it's probably not quite as critical, but uh, you, you need to have an, a plan of the elevation of the road to be, and that's where Robert would come in. So well, that's whatever, what I'm getting at. right. That's exactly what I'm getting at. If you don't have within a, uh, I would say within six inches, the grade, final grade, whether you're going to pave or it's just gravel, it doesn't matter. The the curb establishes the boundary that connects one piece of property to the next. That way, you don't have, you don't, you're not trying to connect sidewalks at different levels because the curb determines the layout right well the curb the curbs on city property along with the complete sidewalk is the way i if i remember right um, i think the sidewalk is actually on city right away i'm not sure robert go ahead so all of the sidewalk, all the curb, and all the asphalt is in city right of way. So part of that 60 foot right of way? Yeah. Well, 60 feet in Louisiana, 50 feet, 40 feet in different places. Different places. Well, you know. Go ahead, Grant. Well, you know, when we're working with half roads, and we're going we're gonna to end up with a final somewhere between 40 and 60 feet. 
if we don't have that general grade established immediately, if you only do part of it and you, you, you put sidewalks or curbs where part of it's done and then you got additional grading on the right or the left, it, it just opens up, it's a monster without the grading being done. Establishing the drainage. Uh, I mean, there's so many things involved. It's not just a matter of, hey, I, you got to have a sidewalk and okay, go for a sidewalk. Is it going to be high? Is it going to be low? Is it going to be, is it going to be the right distance from the center of the road? I mean, those things have to be established. Well, that's why I asked about staff. Who in Vernonia is capable, is trained and capable and going to do that? Or is it going to be dumped on a third party inspector to make sure the property lines and the offsets and the elevation is per plan? Obviously, if we're going to make them do engineering, they're going to have an elevation plan on their sidewalk plan. So, but somebody's got to be capable of checking that, reading that. And um, that's who I'm still waiting to hear who that person is. Go ahead, Robert. I was just going to say that I, it's part of our responsibility as the city engineers to go out and do the final inspections. So once there's a plan in place for how the improvements have to be done, then we can go and double check that that's actually how they're built. Go ahead, Councillor Williams. So Robert, that's your responsibility to establish those things once you're told what we want? Correct. Yeah. Well, well so but once there's a standard that we can judge them on and then they submit the plans to that standard, they can right. then build it once approved and once they build it, we go out and have to inspect it. Yeah. Well, the, the, the problem that I'm seeing is if we do it by a lot by lot, owner by owner, we're, 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 we're not looking down the road far enough to make sure that the next guy is in, in line with what we're trying to do. And that's where I believe the proper grade in the curb establishes the boundary that's absolutely necessary to follow through on our plan. Go ahead, Robert. And I think that's the general agreement that it'd be optimal to have some sort of plan in place where we can say whoever is applying needs to meet so-and-so elevation or make sure that this works with this plan. Like it's been said though, that takes the upfront investment of being able to do some sort of plan in advance of the people applying. So it's that, it's that weighted balance between how much are we able to put up to make that plan happen and how much can we just allow people to put it in without the upfront for city to pay for it. <coughs> I've got a kind of an observation. Um, I drive up um, Mississippi and come down Arkansas every day. And I, I'm just thinking of a long term scenario. If we did put a sidewalk all the way down Louisiana on one side, say, for example, and those, those uh, school kids living up in that area above the school my observation now that they take the fastest route and the quickest route and so there's a majority of the kids that live up in that area up on top louisiana that walk down mississippi they walk down arkansas right in the middle of the road and that those those right of ways i in fact i was looking at it this afternoon when i came down and I bet there's not 30 feet from one, one ditch line to the next. And so there's hardly any room um, on those older streets. Um, so go ahead, Josette. 
So it's actually a 60 foot right of way on Mississippi. <laughs> oh, it is? Yeah. So it goes into their yard. And the thing I was um, thinking is, I understand the reasoning for um, kind of worrying about the elevation, but really the the reality of paving any of these roads is not very smart without a curb and gutter. Because you're kind of paving and it's just gonna slough off. The longevity of the city's investment is the most efficient when you actually have curb and gutter on both sides and your lift is last, lasting and it's crowned and it's shedding the water to the right place. So while I understand that it's hard to kind of piecemeal it, it's hard to require it of the people, if ultimately our goal is that the roads that aren't paved are paved or that are chip sealed are paved long term, the sidewalk curb and gutter in the right of way is really what we need to be aiming towards. I get that some of us live on streets with no curb and gutter and sidewalk, but that can't be what influences our decision on whether or not long term we want that standard to be met. I mean, because on one hand, you can't like that you don't have a sidewalk, but then want Andy to put them up at Louisiana. Does that make sense? Like, yeah, Councilor Williams. Uh, uh, Mayor, I, I agree completely um, as far as how narrow some of those streets are. If you were to pave, not pave, but if you were to curb and sidewalk some of the streets that you've mentioned, there, there wouldn't be room for two-way traffic because there are spots where the road just drops off I agree with Josette, uh, if, if you don't have curbs on both sides, then you end up with just a lot of slough off and, and bumpy roads with potholes and all kinds of problems. So, I mean, I think we're dealing with the situation where if it's new development, if there is adequate room to do what our vision is to curb, sidewalks, paved, you know, the whole nine yards, we have every responsibility to make sure they're up to snuff. But in places where it's impossible, I, I don't even think it should be considered because we can't do it. Go ahead, Joseph. So Grant, what you're seeing there when you see that narrow width, width is just that the city's only paved that. Those right-of-ways would have 60 feet in between the back of the sidewalk, the road, and the other back of the sidewalk. So where you see just like a eight to 12 foot paving strip, that's just because that's the base that was there in the city at the time paved it. It doesn't mean that it's not, that if you were gonna require sidewalks, those sidewalks would be set back up against the property line and you would pave the full width with the travel lanes and everything, long term. At minimum, you would have sidewalk, gravel, base, sidewalk, and then pave at a later date. That's what I'm saying. So yeah, there is a skinny, non-passable coating right now. That's not what's in the right of way, where the public owns it, if that makes sense. There's more land. I don't know what I'm trying to explain. Well, I understand what you're saying, but if you've got a house and the, and the, the earth drops off and then you've got your eight or 10 feet of pavement and then it drops off again, you're gonna be so close to the house and you, everybody's gonna to have to build a retaining wall and get new dr uh, driveways. Uh, some of those areas up there where we drive those school buses, uh, the idea of even a 30 foot road, not a 60 foot, a 30 foot flat area where you could have one sidewalk, one curb, and a, and a passable lane. We're, we're talking some tough places up there on that hill. And there's other places where, because of those big trees, the only way you could make the road any wider would be to cut down all the trees. And I don't think those people want those trees down. 
maybe somebody does, but I bet a lot of them like their trees in the summer when it's hot. All the trees in Arkansas would have to come out because when there's yeah. somebody when there's somebody parked on the in front of their house, yeah. I I have to yield to upcoming traffic. Yeah. And I can't there's no two way traffic going down that road. Yeah. Yeah, but they're also gonna have to come out if they die because they're in the city's responsibility zone. So one way or the other the trees aren't going to be there forever, right? So, and, and, and who's, no one's saying we're going to go bust all the trees out and put a sidewalk on Arkansas. Right. But if you take, for example, Second Avenue up, up here by Cory Hill, right. it's flat. And by having no curb and gutter and sidewalk, the neighbors have just encroached into the right of way where we're constantly fighting them to stay out of the right of way with block walls, stacking wood. I mean, so there's Rash. there's a there's a positive and negative on the pushback. Dale, go ahead. We're we're straying a little bit from the subject at hand because I don't think any of us are talking about going back and retrofitting current streets, although that could happen. But in that scenario if there's a vacant lot in any of these areas that homeowner though if, if we're ripping the band-aid off he will have to meet that criteria and what's that going to look like uh, he's going to put in a curb on his side curb and gutter on his side of the street it's not even going to match up with the current street because he's going to build it so when the street would actually build out correctly, I would assume we wouldn't let him build it to where our street is. No. Uh, so he's going to be pushed back. It, I don't know how functional it will be. And then you'll have a sidewalk to go to nowhere on both ends. Um, say on well, Arkansas. We got to look, look further than just the next 10 years. And ultimately, if he pushed back his sidewalk, he'd have to fill in the distance between our pavement and his approach to his house with gravel. So slowly over the course of time, the, the full width of the road gets built out, whether it's by us, whether it's by piecemeal homeowners. But I feel like we're, we're just worried about what effect it will have, so we're going to do nothing. We're just going to keep not having it. And I don't know that the legalities, I heard someone mention something which worried me a little bit, is on new development, we're going to do this. And on old development, I don't think you can have two different standards legally. I could look into it, but I'm pretty sure you can't. Yeah, I'd agree with that. The only trouble is you don't have a mechanism for to get like Arkansas build out. It would... Uh, you know, if there isn't a vacant lot there and somebody building a new home, uh, I don't even think if a house burned out, could you require it then? Uh, hey, you could form an improvement district and say, hey, everyone, we're pulling off this project. The city's putting skin in the game so that your street can be paved to the right depth, the right overlay. And we're forming an improvement district and we're all going to chip in together and get this done. Okay. That's the mechanism. Stephanie. If a house is burned or tore down and rebuilt, they have to meet all the standards. Not only design standards, but that also includes sidewalk, curb, and gutter. So they would come to you for a waiver, pay the fee, or just have to put it in. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, Grant. Well, you know, one thing that crossed my mind is I, I remember when there was a two-way street there by the city hall, and it became necessary to put in a one-way. Uh, if, you, if you have um, some streets that are more difficult in the interim, before you go full-blown, everybody's got two ways, paved, curb, sidewalks, and a whole deal. If, if we were to choose one main road and then establish one ways and one way out 
That way, we wouldn't have to do it all at once. Like you go up the hill, Arkansas, that would be a one way. And then you come back down Texas, that's the way out. I mean, that's just a thought. Maybe that's a way that we could um, partially solve the problem until we are able to do all this street the full nine yards. I think something like that would be possible as a workaround in difficult situations. I think it's important that there be an established goal for what the long-term idea is, what's going to be the long-term standard for any new development or any re redevelopment that happens. Like you're saying, if there's a house that's burnt down and they have to meet that new standard, everybody's going to have to come to some new standard eventually. I think it's important to know what that is so that we can all work on the same page. Does that mean that you have sidewalks on both sides? That you have a road? These are, I think, the kind of decisions that need to be made before some kind of um, mechanism can be put in place to decide what somebody has to do. Because it's, it's based off of what they have to do. Go ahead, Grant. Um, I, I'm trying to analyze uh, what was just said. On Missouri, for instance, let's say a house burns down. We've got the standard that says from the middle of the road, you got to go 30 feet. Okay, that's the law. That's what's required. The neighbors on both sides, that new requirement is going to give them real nice parking. but everybody else is going to have the old 15 20 foot wide road so if if we if we say your house burns down you got to build to the the current standard we're going to have some weird looking streets probably a long time <laughs> yeah that's how it is for everyone right now though i have three burned down houses and one demo they're a couple of them are manufactured homes and a couple are uh, old law or old mill homes and they all have to meet the standards. They have to meet setback, setbacks, they have to meet the different design standards they had to come to for a waiver. This, I mean, re right now they have to meet all of those standards. That's design standards, but not road standards, is it? It's included in that, yes. Well, wouldn't that make it kind of awkward for the neighbors that weren't required to uh, do all that? I don't know what you mean. Okay, you 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 you've got the the new the design standard for the curb, the width of the road, and the sidewalk. Yep. Somebody's house burns down; they build it to the code, and then everybody else they've got a real nice pull-in parking spot and everybody else has still got grass right up to a narrow road. So, I mean, how, how do, how do we transition from what's there to what the new standard is if we don't require it on the whole street? That's what you guys need to decide is if you guys are going to form re local improvement districts, always get them all messed up. Sorry. Yeah. Um, but that's what you guys need to decide. Are you guys going to do the fee and loo and then not do anything until you guys are ready to build the whole road? Are you just going to make that person build theirs out and then hope everyone else follows suit, which does happen? Um, or are you going to not require anything? Go ahead, Grant. I agree with the earlier statement that if we require a fee in lieu and a house burns down on Mississippi, and we use all of that money to fix that. And then the people who built off of uh, Louisiana, they've still got gravel, no curbs, no streets, whatever. I agree, they're gonna be mad. They're gonna, you're, they're gonna think we are really getting ripped off. If we put take that money and we don't put in it, put the development right there where the money was uh, gotten in front of that new house. I can see a lot of trouble with that. 
Go ahead, Robert. I think that's absolutely one of the big points, and that's part of the responsibility of deciding how can the money be managed? How can we use it for the improvements that need to happen? We've said that one of the options is that you can use it as the city sees best fit and work around the city, but it can completely be put in place that you can only use it, uh, say, if you get it from a block on Louisiana, you only use it on a block in Louisiana. That can be that's a totally valid option. Does that answer your question, Grant? Kind of. I, I can just see some really bumpy transitions because if if the money that's taken from a from a new homeowner is enough to take care of the road in front of their house and you on both sides of them that is neglected until somebody builds there uh i, ju I just see problems maybe i'm maybe i'm not thinking deep enough or maybe i'm thinking too deep i don't know but it just seems to me like if you're going to do you can't just do in front of one house Allen. Well, Grant, I kind of, I understand what you're saying, but I do reject that in a way because you can do it right every time. And if it's the one person doing it right, then it's one person doing it right. Um, you talked about having to have this or that tearing out your sidewalks or driveways later. Well, if you don't put in the curb gutter sidewalk and put your driveway to it, then when we come in later and say we got to do it, you're tearing stuff out anyway. You're tearing out people's building planters and flowers and a culvert and a box or something or planting trees. So you're gonna go backwards and cost you more eventually, one way or another. So I'm in building, we do it right the first time, done deal, looks great, walk away. So if, if that's the kind of city we want, we gotta make the tough decision that a lot of people aren't gonna like. But 30 years down the road, they're gonna say, wow, Mr. Williams and Mr. Webb and them made a good decision. Now we got sidewalks and safe places for our kids to walk in a bus stop and it's not 20 feet wide because they didn't build out the road because the right of way is there. I've got six feet or seven feet in places probably behind those big trees to the pin. So I could put a sidewalk behind the trees, probably put a curb in front of the trees and they're probably right in the planter strip. If the old timers put it in the right spot, which I kind of have a feeling most of them are, um, there's always variances that can be allowed for big trees. That's why people come to city council and they put a little curve around their sidewalk like they do in Portland. But um, I, I have a hard, it's, I understand all the, all of it. I really do. Um, but the juggling the money and who gets what and where, I, that's kind of lost on me. Just like you said, I, I, I don't think that's going to be a happy end for anybody. So um, I think improvement districts are pretty good, except for when city gets involved, you're talking ripping out a whole street, ripping out trees, doing subgrade, new sidewalks, curbs, everything for the length of, uh, of, of uh, Arkansas, I'm going to get a bill for 60 grand. And are we going to allow people to do their own work at that point if we say we're going to go in there? So there's another question. Um, um, yeah, so I don't know if the old areas are ever going to catch up but the new areas of darn sure got to catch up or we're going to have a school surrounded by junk and that's my big focus uh, is on all this area around the school that in 50 years will look just like my neighborhood and not that it's junk but it's not safe for kids so that's kind of where i'm shooting from but i definitely see your points go ahead grant JR, it, it's, it's really great to hear you thinking outside the box because, you know, I mean, what I think we've been talking about up to this point is street, curb, sidewalk, maybe with a narrow three or four foot planter strip. But if we could put the sidewalks on the other side of those trees in some places, and I've seen cities that do that. I've like I used to live up in Spokane and they there's places where they had a medium with a curb street medium and then a wide planter space with huge trees and then the sidewalks. 
So if we're willing to think outside the box, I think we can, uh, you know, I mean, we, we won't have as many people mad at us. I'm pretty sure, uh, and, and Robert can probably back me up on this, a lot of cities have standards, which we've got to probably adopt our public work standards, where a 60-foot right-of-way would have a six-foot planter strip if it's a main thoroughfare. And some of these smaller ones would have a three-foot planter strip or a four-foot planter strip or no planter strip if it's an alley or something. Or, you know, we're not going to probably have sidewalks and curbs in an alley, but um, like I'm saying, there's they got standards set for these big wide streets and that's just the way it is. Um, which gives you room for trees and grass or bark dust or flowers or whatever people, you know, want. Um, am I correct on that statement there, Robert? Absolutely. I think that was also part of what I was trying to address with the document was that a certain level of the standards needs to be updated, uh, certainly revised to give uh, new applicants more clarity on what they need to design and to what degree. Um, I added then that general layout for what a 60 foot right away could look like. You know, that's just, I think that's a generally standard way to approach it where you do have sidewalk, you do have a planter strip, you have curb and you have pavement. Um, there are obviously fancier versions and there are more basic versions, but there's a, there's definitely a standard to which people need to be held accountable to. Exactly. I think no matter what we decide to go on, I think the city needs a direction from council of where we really want to go so they can get their ducks in an order as far as who's going to do what, who's going to pay for what, uh, uh, adjust their public work standard, get it all revamped. So when people come in, it's not, it's black and white, real clear. Um, this is what I got to do. Um, this is a setback. This is the planner strip. Um, all that stuff ready to go. So am I correct on assuming that? Jill said that it wouldn't be, we voted tonight, it'd be implemented tomorrow because there's some things that we need to housekeeping. Well, so you could form consensus tonight since it's a work session, but we would bring whatever you guys propose to a meeting for you actually to vote on it and, and then add it. It would have to be added into Title IX to become effective. Right, I'm talking about an implement, implementation, implementation date um, because it looks like our standards need some updating and some other things to be ready to go on this if, if just say we ripped off the band-aid. Yeah, so we you'd probably give us a date to hit um, and our standards are pretty stringent. It's that we don't have the examples, we don't have schematics or ways to show different versions we're expecting from the customer, which other cities have, and that's what Lower Columbia was referencing to is kind of that kind of, here's your drawing, boom, 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 do all these things. Yeah, all your intersections, all your wheelchairs, all your slopes, all the stuff you have yeah. to have for your corner lot. Right. And that's what you, you told me today you're, you're working on, Josette, along with Columbia Engineering to for your public works department? Well, we've had a few of, we've had them draw a few of them, but that's a bigger project to do everything we need. If I may, I think, again, establishing what the overall goal is, what is it that we want to accomplish? Does the future right away look like having two sidewalks, two planter strips, and a fully paved uh, roadway? Um, I think that's kind of the most basic thing to establish if that's going to be the new standard. And off of that, we can work further to decide, hey, in a 60 foot right away, this is what it looks like. In a 50 foot, in a 40 foot, this is what it looks like. Yep. Um with the streets, curbs, and sidewalks, uh, there's underneath all of that, there's water, there's sewer, there's all those things. Um, all of those things uh, 
don't they all have to be remedied before we uh, pave and curbs and sidewalk? I mean, if, if the if the city's got plans for upgrading those infrastructure things, doesn't all of that have to happen first? That Unless should you go back and dig up a brand new road. Exactly. That should happen first. And that's also part of the document where if we're talking about the Louisiana Avenue project as something that the city takes on, uh, a lot of that sewer and water system is already in place. And it's about two blocks worth that don't have sewer and water, which would be highly advantageous to put in before the pavement, like you're saying, so that future development doesn't rip up what was just put in. Yeah, the goal would be to have kind of stub out to the to the general direction, basically like ends to nowhere off of the intersection. So if the different letter streets start coming, they would just tie into that instead of having it um, cut through. You can see if you drive out Nickerson, you can see where we put the new storm in. Yes, yes. It's settled and we're going to have to go back and re cold patch because it just, yeah, it does just settle in. You got to keep up on that until it's level with the rest of it. You want to avoid that. You're right, Grant. Go ahead, Grant. It also seems to me like um, we need to have more than just one plan. Uh, I think we need to have like several options because the topography is different, the slopes are different. Uh, the, the ability to make a wide street first is places where it, it's not as easy. Uh, so are, are, are we thinking A, B, and C options that are going to... No, uh, so, so basically what's required in the code is based on what type of street it is, right. whether it's an arterial or a collector or just a local side street. So right. that's what right. determines what the profile looks like, whether you have to have a planter strip or like on my neighborhood, we it's not, it's just a local road. So we don't have a planter strip. We just right. have curb gutter right. sidewalk. And then the my grass comes to the back of the sidewalk. Um, so it's really in the transportation systems plan that the city has that has shows you those profiles. So State Avenue has to have two passing lanes parking lanes, all the extra kind of things because it's a bigger collector. Right. Um, but like my side street doesn't just because it's smaller. So, but that's all lined out. I don't know that you could have A, B, or C based on topography because we are so hilly. Um, you could have, you know, state code doesn't really mandate or, or inspect any more retaining walls. But if we were going to put in a, a sidewalk as pro part of an improvement district and there was a bluff, you would pour a small, a short retaining wall to hold that back. You, you know, you, that would have to be in part of, if you were going to do an area that for a local improvement district that had that kind of thing, you would kind of be planning that out before you go to the group and or it just slept into the hill. Robert was going to say something. Yeah, I'd say that there's also always site-specific variables. So we can say that we're going to have one standard and that needs to be adopted to wherever it's really going in. A flat area is obviously going to be the easiest because they can probably just do exactly what the standard is. And then if you have a lot of weird topography, might have to be adjusted a bit to make it work or you know adjust it to make it as reasonable as possible all we have, we have to do is figure out how to pay for it <laughs> i'm sorry Hello. for interrupting grant go ahead grant I said, now all we got to do is figure out how we're going to pay for it. Builders pay for it. That's the easiest way to just make them pay for it and say build it. Um, you pass it on to the homeowner like we've done. 
they're never going to want to do it when you go up there and knock on their door and say, hey, remember that re remonstrous? No, I don't remember that. I didn't sign that. I'm not doing that. Then it's a legal battle for years. Um, but it's, it's not really a legal battle because the waiver being signed against the property does not allow them to vote no in an improvement district. That's, a, well, that's given up when they sign that waiver against the property and the waiver runs with the property, not the owner. So if they did their due diligence and got a title report before they bought a house and read it, they would know that exists on there. So that's one way. I mean, legally, we're not going to have a legal battle if we say, hey, everyone on I Street that signed a waiver, the city's going to require you to put in a sidewalk in this improvement district. They, they forfeit the right to vote no at that point when they when the property has a waiver. Go ahead, Grant. Okay, just for instance, uh, you have a block where on the main street, you have two houses. Then you have a block with nothing. Then you have another block with two houses. What happens in between the sidewalk, the curb and the paving you have a block with nobody that's paid for it. Then you go to the next block and they have paid for it and you got street, curb, sidewalk. What, what, do, you, what do you do with no man's land there? Who pays for that? Gravel, dirt, uh, asphalt, back and forth. Uh, so who pays I'm for not, that no man's land? I'm not really following Grant. So if there was no home there, and it was just a vacant lot. Right. Um, what's in my neighborhood right now is I have, there's one vacant lot. Right. What the city required my husband to do as a developer was yeah. to, at minimum, pour the curb. Right. No sidewalk there because we didn't know when they build where they're going to put their driveway apron. But right. the, by making him pour the curb, the city could then do the the road could be to the right elevation and then when someone comes in they cut the curb put their driveway apron and finish their sidewalk so that's one way to have developers do it if there isn't a current home built there i don't know um that you do anything with no man's land until there's a home built there so yeah you would have sidewalk and then nothing on either side until those homes are built out but part of it and we're not kind of thinking this way part of the curb appeal of a vacant lot is a nice home next to it with a sidewalk and a driveway approach that's attractive for the person that owns it to sell it and it's shovel ready for the next person to just come in hook to that same elevation and keep going so there is a little bit of kind of mind play in that people will buy quicker a lot that's adjacent to some in infrastructure than a lot that's got nothing. I agree completely. Uh, and, and to go back to my poor illustration, you have a block, uh, one corner there's a house, the other corner is undeveloped. Then you come to a block where there's no development at all. And then let's say next to that block, that corner lot is not developed, but there's a house on the far end. So coming down those two streets at that block where there's nothing, uh, who's going to, who's going to do those curbs? Who's, who's going to, how's that going to get well, paid? No, no one, because these requirements all follow development. Okay. The requirements don't even come into play until you're actually developing something, a home, a duplex, something like that. Okay. So it'd be similar to how if you, if you drive on or drove on 4th Avenue when Bud Dow had the, the uh, east houses, the ones that were adjacent to Lincoln School, but there right. was nothing on the, on the west side. Right. And then as those homes got built, they put in sidewalks along the west side. So yes. for a while, we had homes on one side, bare land. Right. And it stayed there till someone got it, was, it was attractive to someone to, start construction and Blackhawk Homes came in and built six houses with sidewalks and everything. Thank you.
I was just going to call on you, Councillor Webb. <laughs> I've been kind of quiet. <laughs> Taking it all in. Just wanted to add to Grant's comment, though. If you did have the fee and lieu program, that's what would pay for those sidewalks and those vacant gaps. Yes. But, and you would tie things together that would make sense. Um, you know, who knows? Maybe we end up putting a sidewalk assessment on everybody and we get our sidewalks around town, but probably be new council members here next election. So. <laughs> That'll be the reality. But that can't be a this. reason not to do it, Dale. <laughs> well, yeah, but who are you going to get? <laughs> they might come in and rescind everything we do, Josette. Yeah, but I don't know. Title IX, they'd have to get it through LUBA and everybody, to, or Division of State Lands, to be able to oh, okay. revert on Title IX. Well, this is a one-shot deal. Go ahead, JR. I was going to argue um, a little bit there on Dale's point. Uh, he talked about the fee and lieu filling in the, the gaps. Well, if you don't have it mandated, you're not going to have any gaps to fill in. The money's just going to be in a pot, and then we'll, someone's got to say, well, let's do some sidewalks over here or something, and, and then everybody's mad because you're tearing up their landscaping or something. So that, uh, that's, that's where I wanted to make that point is, I don't know. And then also another point I wanted to ask Josette was, are they paying for a percentage of the of the asphalt to the center of the street also in, in an SDC fee somehow when they're building this property out? No, so SDC fees are just for increasing capacity. So it isn't a promise that there will ever be asphalt there, especially if the roads, if they're building on a last lot of a fully built out road, it wouldn't increase the capacity for us to pave that. So we couldn't use those SDCs for that kind of thing. Right. I'm just kind of trying to get my head wrapped around where the money for the asphalt is going to come from, or is it just going to continue like we are? Um, you know, you put in curbs and gutters, pretty soon people are going to say, hey, where's the asphalt? Yeah, and I think part of the gas tax money, the, the money we get into streets for contracts, services or the SEA, the small cities allotment. If we had an improvement district where all of the pedestrian amenities were put in by the neighbors, SEA would love to pay that because they want the ADA Safe Route to Schools access and they would think, oh, that's skin in the game and our money on top of that really makes a good product. So that's the kind of thing that would be enticing if a group went in on a lo local improvement district that the city could come around the next year or within two years and actually get it paid through a system like the small cities allotment. Councilor Williams. Do we have the liberty to uh, have more than one payment plan? I mean, like, can we have a fee in lieu? Can we have uh, some other options or is there, do we have to just pick one way we're gonna pay for stuff? Go ahead, Robert. I think what I was trying to illustrate in that document was that it's really how you decide to structure it. Uh, the most basic structure, I think, like we started out saying, was that the applicant has to do the installation. And commonly, they have the alternative to do a fee in lieu. It doesn't have to be either or. And again, this is all what's being decided right now. So if you want, five different options for them to work with that's possible it just i think muddies up a little bit of how it happens yeah. yeah it just seems to me like different situations might create a different uh you know i mean it's a different scenario in in every time you build yep it, it, there's no cookie cutter uh way to do this i don't think Councilor Allen. A question for Mr. Webb. If I collected the fees for sidewalk and curb on your property and your father's property, and then I gave it to the city, do you think they would get it done cheaper than if you had to do it yourself? I don't know. They might have economy of scale if they were doing the whole neighborhood at once. 
versus what I could get. Well, you got to mob everybody up here. You got to pay prevailing wage. You got a city asking for a bid, which is going to be full bore. Uh, that's that's oh. the problem I have with uh, the city contracting it out. But you now you can do a large scale project, and and you're right. You, hopefully, you can get more footage for your money. Um, so, Jr., you keep saying prevailing wage. Yeah. But it's unless really we have federal funds tied to it, we don't fall under that. Okay. Well, you guys provided it in these documents. Well, if if it's a public works project, then that could kick in. If we, if as the city hire ABC Concrete or put out bids for ABC Concrete, it doesn't necessarily have to fall prevailing wage unless we're using federal funds to pay for it. So there's there's a it's, there's different versions of how it could happen. One is prevailing wage. One is not the same. Okay, I understand. I, I might have misread that, but it did talk about it in here, having to hire prevailing wage. Yeah, if it's deemed a public works project in the state, if if it's like a over hits a threshold and all these hoops, then yes, it could end up being prevailing wage. But that doesn't just because public works are working on it doesn't mean it automatically becomes prevailing wage. What if it was an improvement district and it was two blocks long? I mean, you're not going to find Joe Blow that can do that. So, well, so that being everyone's money, it would really depend on how you if how you um, fit it out. If it had any grant well, money mixed into it, if if it was from the feds, then yes you hit prevailing wage and you're paying Davis Bacon, you're probably tracking payroll and all of that. If it's different money, like a like SCA grant, grant, we don't pay prevailing wage for the small city's allotment. Partly because once you get away from the federal ties, you can use money more efficiently if it's state funded. It doesn't have the same, you gotta pay a painter $32 an hour. Right. Well, any fee in lieu would be the residents' funds, money. so there would right. be no. It would be like city money. Yeah, so it'd be contract. You could contract. Use it to contract. Right. Go ahead, Grant. Josette, what would happen if the federal money, uh, the the Fed gave money to the state, and then the state gave it to us? Does it does it does it link back to the Fed? It depends on how washed it is. If they uh, gave the state the money and it came into their ODOT pot, right? there's certain things that still have prevailing wage. If it's muddied down, there's some things that it no longer holds those federal loops. So it just depends on which department you're getting it from in the state. Thank you. I'd like to ask our city administrator what she would think of managing and of the fee in lieu and, and how that she thinks that would work out for the city. Um, I think if you did the fee in lieu and it stayed with the area, mm -hmm. um, that would be a pretty easy thing to manage with the GIS system. We could do a layer that documents a B and Lou over properties, then when you got enough of them in a color, then you would pull off the project, so to speak. That's one way to solve it. Um, I do understand the idea of it being bouncing around the community. However, I'm with you and people don't want to pay for something that doesn't benefit them or they're more likely to be upset by that. Um, the management part of it, I think, with the system we have with GIS, we could we could track things pretty easily um, as it came in. But that being said, it you know, my gut feeling is rip off the bandaid and make people do it, and take and then 
slowly work through projects where you form improvement districts on the areas as so say we get the project and the Louisiana North-South connection goes through and we grade it all and we put storm in it, I would be pulling the plug to have all of those letter streets that signed waivers in improvement districts and finishing off their streets in a heartbeat. Because I think that's the kind of action that gives more benefit. And honestly, going from a gravel road to a curb sidewalk, curb, and gutter road with potential overlay only is going to make their house value go up. It's not going to hurt them at all to have to participate in it. And I still haven't gotten my legal uh, legal statement, but I still do believe, and the legal thought, it was the same, but we haven't got it proven yet, that if we form an improvement district, if it's government mandated through an improvement district, their mortgage company would have to allow them to put it on the end of the mortgage. So that fear about all of a sudden making everyone pay four grand for a sidewalk, we haven't got the final legal summary of it, but if that's not something that's going to harm the citizens and that they could over the course of the remaining 22 years they have on their mortgage put $4,000 on that and it won't negatively affect them, that takes a little bit of the sting out of it for the city forcing the requirement, in my perspective. If I could do that as a homeowner, it would hurt sting a lot less than if I had to find $4,000. Right. And so what about before if- Before we finalize, we double, triple check. That's the way it is. Yeah, I'm just wondering about the holdout people. They've got a little house, they've been here forever, and they're 85 years old, they own their house, so you're not gonna put it on the back of their mortgage. They don't have the money to pay, so is the city gonna have the money just to go ahead and do it anyway, and then what are they gonna do? Put a, a lien on the house at the sale? Probably. We've done, we have that for outstanding utility bills. We have an ordinance that will, would let us do it if someone was in arrears for utility. And we've done that with a number of loans through community action team that when the house changes hands, then the city as the pass through pays back community action team for the loan they recorded against the property. So we've done that. I've seen where one of these cities in here, I can't remember which one, Stephanie probably can, where they do an improvement district and then council lets them out of pan. Yeah. They just do it. They must have more money than we do. Right? I'd like to Yeah, they must, yeah. Anyway, I, it doesn't really matter which one it was. But. Councilor Williams. I like your idea, Josette, of keeping the, mayor, the the money in the area. If you if you're gonna do a fee in lieu, then uh, if if the people can see the work that's being you know done from the money that they've invested, I think that takes a lot of the sting out of that particular option. Instead of it being on the other side of town and they don't see anything in their area. So, I mean, that, that's a, a bonus to that method of payment. You guys want to hear from the mayor? Yeah. Okay. Go ahead, mayor. I, I kind of, I, I read all through the packet and, and read Robert's recommendations about the reimbursement district and the different options and uh, the frontal uh, and utility divisions and all. And, and I, I've been thinking a lot about the last couple of days about the fee and lieu, and I, I kind of came into this meeting, um, and I even talked to to Josette and Stephanie about it today about how I like the fee and lieu, and I thought it would be a pretty good idea. But I'll have to admit, uh, Jr., when you opened it up, you, you gave a pretty compelling argument about ripping the band-aid off and i looked at the long-term situation and, and 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 i you know josette talked about we should think longer than 10 years out and and i looked at the future and i think 
by ripping the bandaid off and putting it on the applicant, I, I, I think it would really set a standard. And once you once you set that standard, you're going to have a, I think, in 20 years, you're going to have a really nice area to live in. And um, those are $400,000 homes and being built up there now. And and um, so I kind of changed my mind a, a little bit on, on the C and Lou and uh, I'm just going to, like Dale said, it's going to be a little easier for us, but um, I'm looking in the long run, long term, and, and I, I think it would be better for everyone involved if we just went ahead and and uh, put it up to the to the owners. Oh. Go ahead, JR. Uh, yeah, you know, when you first read it, the fee and Lou jumps out at you a nice way of easing into it. But number one, who's going to set the fee? The person that's getting that fee is going to think, I'm getting ripped off. Or we set the fee too low and we go to do it in a district and we get sticker shock. Then what do you do? Um, and prices are going up, you know. Look at lumber has doubled in like five years. It's now $46 for a sheet of OSB half inch or something. It used to be $10 a sheet. Concrete goes up all the time. I used to buy it here for, I think I got it for $53 a yard delivered. I could get a two yard minimum. Now it's probably 125 a yard and there's a seven yard minimum, I think in Bernonia or something. So, I mean, nothing gets cheaper. And from a person building a new house, I'd rather say, okay, this is what I got to do. Here's the plans. The engineers draw it all up. The builder does it. And it's pretty cut and dried. I'm paying for what I got. I know the price going into the mortgage. Uh, but the problem is who's going to set the rate? I mean, does, it, does any of us here do estimating for a living? That'd be kind of tough to say. Well, we think this is what it's going to be in five or seven years when we go to do this or 10 years, but things double or triple sometimes in 10 years. That's yeah, the problem. Wouldn't, wouldn't it just be part of the resolution for the master fee schedule and that it wouldn't be contained in Title IX? It would be sitting where it could be addressed every two years for a change, Robert? Can you do that? Not many of the people actually have it in their land use code, right? The amount? I would say that it's most commonly a percentage of an engineer's cost estimate. So as, oh, okay. so as the improvements are designed, they also need to submit an engineer's cost estimate, and then they are charged a percentage of that. Usually, you know, we've said 120 to 175% of that. So it would change as, as the cost goes up. Um, I don't, I haven't seen a fluctuating percentage. No, I mean the cost, the you could change as the concrete gets more expensive, that 175% estimate would follow the current cost. Exactly. Yeah. So, the, so that's how so, you do it. So you'd still have to get all the engineering and have the design, but then you'd just pay the city and not do it. So it, that seems like even a more of a cost. I mean, if you're already gonna design it and engineer it, why not just do it as you build the house? You got the equipment there, you got the contractors there. To me, it just kind of seems, I don't know, maybe I'm just ready to rip the Band-Aid off, but to me, it seems complicated to do it any other way. And, and from a, if I was if I was honestly if I was a city administrator, I just want you let them do it, make it nice. I don't want to deal with it and argue and fight with people over this, and decide where the money goes and keep track of it. I don't know. I just wouldn't want to do it. No, that's my gut would say rip the bandaid off, but that's not my decision to make. Right, I'm starting to think like if I was running the city too, what would I want? And I could still come back to the same thing. If we're going to do it, rip the Band-Aid off and let the new people that build house do it. Councilor Webb. 
Yeah, and new developments it only makes sense. And I think what what we're seeing in Louisiana, that's basically a development. But the heartburn I have is the oddball one offs that like Grant says, maybe it's got a big high bank there. It'd be easier for that landowner to pay the fee in lieu. Um, even if it engineered, you know, even all the engineering costs and whatever, knowing that maybe it's never going to get put in. Um, I mean, there's, there's, and then the infills, the people that now we're talking about burnouts, and, you know, maybe for to preserve that street look that you already have, they just pay the fee in lieu. Um, but we want them to not have that street look, Dale. They're already putting their wood piles in the right of way. <laughs> Maybe that's what they like. <laughs> oh, but that's uh, not what everyone else likes when you drive down the road. Right. Yeah, but those are two separate issues, though. I mean, you, you shouldn't be allowing anybody putting stuff in the right of way to begin with. But, but to have that step one segment of sidewalk to nowhere. Uh, in a neighborhood that you know you're not going to probably get that corrected in the next 30 years. Uh, but but you potentially could. If the, if the contractor is smart, he would go door to door and say, I'm putting in a sidewalk at your next door neighbors. Would you, you know, and, and build a job out of it and put four sidewalks in? You never know. Well, you never know, but I kind of know Vernonians. I think they kind of like what they have and kind of like leaving it away, and they don't like parting with their greenbacks either. So um, I but don't I know. I think the demographics I, are changing. I think we are a hub for Metro is way out pricing people, and so I think it's not the same person that's had the house since 1960 anymore. They sell the house to someone who potentially would put a sidewalk in if offered, you know? I mean, the turnover is happening. Well, there's nothing stopping them from doing it now. If they want to put a sidewalk and do everything, they can do it now. No, but what I'm saying is if the burnout house has to put in a sidewalk to come up to code and someone just bought the house next door from the homeowners that owned it for 60 years and was asked, I think they may be of the idea that they would probably participate in that if it was going to bring their house value and make the front of their street. So the other tricky thing, I don't know how many of you looked on GIS, but the areas that are paved on a lot of our streets are off center. So on one half, this neighbor's got all this grass out in the middle of the right of way where this neighbor, their property line is the edge. So the sidewalk will actually benefit the person who's on the tight edge in putting it in because it pushes the traffic away from their property line and more towards their neighbor who's living in the right of way, so to speak. So there's a lot of them that are that way, that ultimately I could see people participating because they're like, hey, nobody cuts on to my neighbor's property anymore. I'm going to do the same thing and kind of domino effect, maybe. I don't know. Don't say the P word. You almost lost me, Joe said. What's the P word? <laughs> when you were talking demographics changing, I thought you were going to say Portland. No, I just, I think even St. Helens. I mean, there, it's, everything's so expensive in the cities proper that people are looking to get away. Plus, our SDCs are too low, but that's a huge draw for people trying to get out of wherever they're at that's too expensive into somewhere adjacent that's not as expensive. When I go to the streets like yours or up to Fourth or Nickerson even, I'm thinking, wow, this, this is nice to have a sidewalk. You know, I've lived here for 40 years and I've never had a sidewalk. Maybe I should put one into nowhere and start it here. I don't know. There you go. Yeah. Champion. <laughs> <laughs> that, that I could do pretty easy. The curb, that'd be kind of a little different, but since you got to start digging into roadways. Councilor Williams. Robert, um, last Christmas, my wife and I went to Scapoose and we turned up the hill to the west 
And as we went up further, the roads got littler and tinier and narrower. And uh, are you familiar with uh, how SCAPUS is implementing uh, the changes that we're talking about in those areas that might kind of correlate to our Second Avenue, First Avenue, whatever? Do you know what they're doing? I can't, I can't say that I'm overly familiar with them, no. Okay. I just wondered because they've got a lot of similar topography than us. I mean, it's more extreme there, I think, because they got a lot more of it. But I just thought maybe you had a little insight on that. Unfortunately not. I, I do have a follow-up question. Go ahead, JR. It comes back to what Councillor Webb was talking with Joe said about like Second Avenue or some of the older streets that actually have a real like a small curb and maybe the street's not quite aligned right and a house burnt down. Somebody comes in, okay, you want it to the standards, they go to the property mark and they cut the curb in. Maybe it's back another foot and a half or two feet. They're not required to close those ends in what happens all the water running down the street then it just dies in on someone's property yeah i think that comes back to improving the standards and you just decide what needs to be done stormwater needs to be managed somehow that can be part of the planner strips yeah but there's nothing there <laughs> Then you'd probably require him to do a little, or the city would do a little cold patch berm that directs it back into the street or something. If we're, you know, we have a few of those, like up on G by Wellers, where the, the water comes down his driveway and was shooting out kind of along, uh, what was the mailman's name, Peter? Peter and Leslie's house. Well, yeah. So the city had to put a cold patch berm to direct the stormwater to the right to the trough where it got collected. So we have that in a few areas where weird little one offs have caused stormwater issue that the crown of the road couldn't handle or didn't direct. Stephanie. We've also had people have to put in, um, it's like a I don't know the technical term. Robert probably does. He's gonna laugh at me, but it's like a almost a French drain where it like weaves back and forth to take care of all that stormwater drainage. So we've had somebody do that before, where they couldn't get the water to the street or any existing infrastructure. So they could do something similar to that. I know it's super technical. <laughs> <laughs> it exists. It's well, a real thing. I, I don't know if you understood my point about cutting an existing curb. A French drain isn't going to cut it there if the water's running against that curb, and then all of a sudden there's a off an offset of the new curbs back further, and there's just nothing there. Like Jill said, said you could put a cold patch berm in or something, but go ahead, Dale Webb. Yeah, so. If we rip the Band-Aid off, so this, all these uh, different division things we're talking about basically are out the window, right? We don't need to worry about the different scenarios of division as far as, right. so, okay. So I wanted to make sure because we're only got a half hour left, make sure we're moving along in our packet a little bit here. So, so if we rip the Band-Aid off, we're going full build out, half street build outs, sidewalk, gutter, gutter and curb. Well, some places there will just be a, a gut, a curb, not a gutter and curb, right? No, there, I think there'd be full build out, so they'd have to have sidewalk, curb and gutter if we're, if we're ripping the Band-Aid off. What scenario do you think it wouldn't? Well, I've built lots of curb in my life, and then there's places where there's curb and gutter connected. It just depends on the, how they're doing the rainwater and the standard. So, oh, yeah. you know, I don't know if the curb and gutter is going to be standard everywhere or just a curb in places. Well, at minimum, it would it 
would be required that they would have the sidewalk curb. If it's a gravel road, the gutter is a different thing, right, Robert? Yeah, again, kind of going back to deciding on what the standard is going to be. You can enforce having curb and gutter, and that kind of takes care of the idea. Even if it's gravel now, you can always pave to it more easily. I'm having a hard time hearing him. What do you say? I was saying that it comes back to what standard gets decided upon. So if you say that there's a curb and gutter, that can be applied to the gravel and to the pavement at any time. Right. I'm just talking about for these little one-offs. Some house burns down, they got to patch it in. I mean, are we really going to do curb and gutter on the small streets? Or are we going to just do curb? It just depends on how the water management system's built into it, I guess. Well, and remember, none of these are only small streets because that's how wide they're paved. All of the streets are 60 feet wide in in but, reality. Then they should have, what, 24 feet of asphalt? The, the layout that I put out has 27 feet of asphalt. 27, 13, 5 in each lane. Yep. And so with that one, there's stormwater management in the planter strip, of course. At some point, you need to be able to connect that to some more official stormwater facility, but that's kind of the starting point of it. And so like on Cory Hill, in either side, if you came across second, fifth, fourth, or something with new sidewalk curb and gutter, you would hook to either the storm ditch on the Halem, or you would come back and go across bridge down to the swale, depending on where you are in the hill. There's In the full built-out areas, there's some bigger channel you would have to get it to, but they exist. In the newer stuff, that'd just be part of the engineering, de deciding where it goes and how it hooks to the bigger system. So we haven't decided our, our planner strip width. I think we need to look at the topography and have a narrow or no planner strip width or it's steep. Because if you're on a steep slope and you're the lucky person that's on the downhill slope, and all of a sudden you got to go to the right standard, which is way out in the middle of the air, you're going to have to fill with a lot of rock or retaining wall or something. So to get, you know, I don't, I don't know if the downhill side of a steep slope can be a different planter width or we have to do a full build out because I can see a situation like Grant was talking about where you're filling in so much that uh, you might almost have rock or something right to your next door neighbor's front porch or something. I don't, you know, I, I'm just wondering how that's going to work. Anything could be filled in. I'm not afraid of that. I mean, you can pour concrete and gravel and compact and do whatever, but I just wonder if we're going to have the same standard of four foot planner everywhere. No, Josette's got no planner. No, so it's basically what type of road it is, right? So Bridge Street, Nahalem, Rose Avenue, State Avenue, those are, those are would all have the planner strip, right? Because they're, okay. the, they're the bigger. And then the little shorties are like mine where it's just a short span of a road in the TSP that has no planner strip. The planner strips for the bigger uh, moving more traffic basically. Okay well you still have the full width 60 foot build out and the sidewalk still goes against the property line of the right away. Well and then some of them this is the weird thing so let me just I'm going to share my screen real quick. So, 
you see how on this one they built the sidewalk inside the property it's not showing up it's coming oh, there it, there it is take a minute you see that yeah not yet oh it should have been in the street there you go All right the existing street. But, <laughs> but the that whole neighborhood theirs are just inside their property line oh right well, which isn't a big deal but still their responsibility it would be their responsibility even if it was sitting in the right-of-way right so that's not a right. huge deal um but this so that's one option. The other thing is, look at these ones. So these guys, they fully did their driveway out. Look how off center that is. See how their driveways have like 20 feet of driveway out in the right of way? Oh, yeah. oh wow. <laughs> and the city could come through there and tear that up if they wanted. Well, we could, we would, we would, potentially cut that and put asphalt over it but they'd still <laughs> so that's how people have remedied setting their properties back having the required distance for their driveway approach to park cars there and then getting the gap to where it's back to pay well i'm glad you showed this joseph because this kind of points to my who's going to do what in the city to make sure this stuff doesn't happen anymore. Well, and right. and Robert, as, Robert, Robert said, indicated that, well, I'll come out and check it all off when it's done. Well, when it's done, it's too late. You well, need no, someone to check it before they pour it. Yeah, but there's a whole process in, in the, they could have left those gravel. They just did that on their own. And they know that it's in the right of way, their driveway approach. They just did it to have a nice, fluid surface getting up to their house they could have left it gravel and gone mm -hmm. off of our asphalt on fifth and just went to gravel and then went to their concrete driveway right so that was just because they wanted the approaches to their house until there is a road to pull with to be nice to access so they all those guys know that we could come in there and fully pave out that road and put in require sidewalks and they would participate I can't read that, but you say that's Fifth Avenue? Yeah, that's Fifth. So if we'd have had a standard and made them do it to a standard, we'd have a full width road up there. With at least and sidewalks was, on the on the houses that exist on the uphill side. The old the downhill side is old is old homes. Right? Oh, gotcha. I guess not all of them. There's a few new ones. Right. But they did just what was required with their approach for their driveway and a little asphalt apron to get there. Now swing over Arkansas. I want to see if those trees have to come out to put a sidewalk in on my house. <laughs> I can't I'm believe it. Sure they do. I can't believe that one house is set back far enough. It looked like the vehicle hardly even fit between the street line and the, the garage. Hold on, it's coming. It's taking a minute for my. Uh, so, you, how accurate is this, Joe? you think it's pretty accurate? Within six inches. Hmm. Gotcha. Yeah, that's what I thought. I had room for a sidewalk, probably right against the property line. Yeah. So. It's for the most part, the houses are pretty sent. Of course, you always have the one offs that build just to the property line and they overhang their, you know, the roof line overhangs. But so that's part of the reason just starting making a starting point for the standard and moving forward with the standard as we go. I think eventually it will come full circle and people will start put them in and then the neighbor will put one in and start piecemealing it or someone new will buy a house and want to put a sidewalk in come get all the information but robert's not so when robert said he comes and checks it there's a whole process they have to submit that in paperwork matt checks it for all the planning codes and make sure it moves setbacks he goes out and does site review so there's all these steps until the final 
review of it being appropriate or deemed correct. Got it. So. Back in the old back in the old days, and I'm probably dating myself a little bit here. This public works used to drive up with a pickup truck. Look, look to the right. Look at the forms I set up, and then take the card off. I hand them and initial it and drive off, with sometimes not even getting out of the rig. So that's that's kind of what I was making sure wasn't going to happen. No. Some people would like that to happen now, but that doesn't happen like that anymore. <laughs> So if we were putting in Missouri, Missouri today, we wouldn't put it in the way we did then. Or are we leave. Well, it's only got a sidewalk on one side. Yeah. Well, I think they got away with that because they wanted all the traffic because the 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 homes were on the opposite side. Um, but yeah, we would we would ask school to foot the bill to either fully do it on both sides or well I think we got an extra width sidewalk on one side that was kind of the trade-off on yeah. that and and you know I think we've talked we would have been excursion excursion into those properties a little bit the way they're built if we yeah. had did it the right way so but then again, those are, so while those houses burns down, they're putting a sidewalk chunk in there on their side of the street. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just, these are the things, these are the devil's advocate things that we have to think through. So if we're gonna do this and then that happens, now we're gonna have somebody with a sidewalk on one side, or we gotta have some outlet that we can go no hold it. It doesn't make sense. We're not requiring it. Is there a variance well, you process? Could, you could still have a waiver only for that specific instance. Right? I mean you could you could choose to make whatever right, Robert? Couldn't they do that? They could say if a home burns down and there's no adjacent sidewalk. <clears throat> Stephanie's got something. Stephanie, go ahead. Yeah, so you can put in exemptions that a replacement of a home, so that way if they're tearing down an old crappy mill house and building the same one with the same footprint, then they wouldn't be required to put in the infrastructure. My thought is, is you would want to make it contingent on if they're staying within the same footprint or if they're increasing in size. Because if they're increasing in size and building a 2,500 square foot home, then they're building a brand new home, basically. So that then they would be required to do it. I thought. Go ahead, Robert. Well, the, that is that you're pretty much saying that there are situations when an alternative is helpful or necessary. So again, if the decision is you just put the Band-Aid and everybody's required to put it in without an alternative, that leaves you in that situation that you're describing is for a person with a burnt down house trying to rebuild it has a weird sidewalk as well. Yeah, I, I'm a little worried about the house fire situation. People have a tragedy, they're having a hard enough time, and then you pile a bunch of costs on top of that. Um, maybe we do need a can come to council in a burn down situation, look at the neighborhood and make a decision um, no matter what council well, that is. I think that's the thing. If it's the same size house. Well, no one's going to build the same size house. Huh? No, not many people are going to build the same size house, especially if it's an old one that's real small. So. Well, the way the burn down houses that were burned down this year exist on their lot, they don't, they've built out so much around them, they don't really have room without taking down other stuff to build something bigger. So that's what I'm saying. You could leave an exemption for it not to trigger if they're staying in the footprint, but if they're gonna build a whole new home, then you'd want the, the infrastructure triggered because you'd want them 
to set the house back what setbacks are currently. You'd want them to not be, you know, closer than five feet on the side from their neighbor, which some of these houses are not five feet away from their property line, which is what fire code well, would, says they should I would, be. I wouldn't think we'd want someone to build back three feet from the line, no matter what. So um, that one. That's what, I'm, that's what I'm saying. If their house, if they're rebuilding their same house and we don't have a requirement for them that triggers them doing the infrastructure, they could build in the same footprint. Couldn't they, Stephanie? No. No, so anybody who, can you hear me? Anybody who's rebuilding a house, whether they tore it out just because they want a new fancy one or if it was burned down, they have to meet the setbacks. Um, so to expand on the wanting to not require them to do the road improvements to build a bigger house, would you then also waive them the SDC requirement? Because these houses that have burnt down, if they build over the size that they are current or were before they burned down, then they have to pay SDCs also. So once you start down that road of, I don't want to have to pay this fee, why not waiving this other fee? And, and it just kind of snowballs. Because it, their insurance is paying for all that. Or they're putting on a mortgage if they're just deciding to build a new house. Good deal. Yeah, but those points aside, it's still, you know, the city, that's our newest street in town, paved street in town, and we were complicit in that design. Uh, it would seem very odd to me to start on a burn down to require somebody to put in a sidewalk that those others aren't going to put in. I wouldn't think. Uh, um it just seems odd you know we've already kind of crossed a threshold on what we wanted in that street and so you're gonna have to have some type of an opt-out laws here um or that's where the fee and lieu comes back into play that's where you you know they they don't hey, i'm not going to put a sidewalk that doesn't connect to anything i'll pay the fee and lieu and then we use that for connectivity throughout the town. But um, I see Robert's got an answer. Go ahead, Robert. Well, I have another option <laughs> where it's it's it could be a decision the council makes if they're allowed to do the PMU. If we're saying that it's, it is an alternative that's open in certain scenarios. And yeah, we're not hearing that. have to decide if they're allowed to use it. So the fee and lieu becomes like a waiver where you have to apply for it and get it approved? Essentially. That could be your option, that we're going to require the standards for those one-offs. And if it was the one of these kind of increments of things happening, then you have the option to apply for a fee and lieu. And that does enforce more strictly the idea that people are going to put in the improvements when they're just doing a regular development. And in odd scenarios, there is that extra contingent of your option for somebody to use the fee and loop. I just got this film. We're going to want that flexibility. I, I think, I think we're going to run into instances where we're saying, no, you got to do it. And, and we're going to get some blowback. I mean, there's going to people are, we're going to get ridiculed because even though we might say we're planning for the next 20 years, they aren't going to see it that way. And, um, current, and personally, I, I, I don't totally buy into it myself. I don't see one guy starting something and then it all is going to fall into place. So, um, But especially like there on Missouri, it, that would be an embarrassment, I think, if we said, oh, you got to put sidewalk in now. It's just going to look weird. Go ahead, JR. Well, lucky for me, I'm not as related to as many people in this town as Councillor Webb. <laughs> and my second point I want to say, if you ever climb a mountain, you have to start with the first step. Somebody's got to take the first step. So it just matters if we're brave enough to take the first step for the future of the town, take a few hits on it, 
and watch it flourish, especially in the new development areas. So um, I'm not against this, uh, a waiver and a fee of lieu in certain circumstances, tragedies, where it doesn't make sense totally. They can come to council or go to the city and bring it through after their engineer. Maybe the engineer says, hey, this would be a good one for the fee and lieu. So I'm not against that. Um, but I think I'm at the point where rip the Band-Aid off, maybe a special fee and lieu in weird circumstances. But uh, I, I think that's where I'm at ultimately. Um, I know Grant's been kind of quiet. <laughs> Taking in a lot. Yeah. Robert, if I could reassert the necessity to have a specific idea for what the goal is moving forward, I think coming up with a standard is very helpful and deciding do is the end goal to have sidewalks on every street. I mean that's not that's not a necessity, but that's something to decide. Go ahead, Joseph. So I'm going to bug Councillor Webb a little bit, but I think one of the missing components in a smart stormwater master plan is having the diversion of a curb and gutter to direct the flow of stormwater off the main street and for people's weep holes to shoot it off their gutters into the system. So. My imploring to Councillor Webb about why we should rip off the Band-Aid is because over time we will only become more efficient and more likely that we can do a stormwater system that actually effectively diverts stormwater. Yeah, what but she I said. <laughs> I'm happy. I think if you, if council has a consensus that they want to entertain the idea of ripping off the Band-Aid and coming up with exemption titling that would allow someone to apply for a fee in lieu to the council, staff and Robert are happy to do that and bring it back to you guys either in a follow-up work session with some standards and kind of help you understand which streets would have planter strips, which ones fall into the category for no planter strips, and just do a follow-up work session, moving this a little closer to a decision um, with some more information for you guys. Yeah, I'm good with that. Uh, Councilor Williams. Josette, I'm good with what you just said, but I can't get out of my mind places like Second, uh, where it when you drive down there, you look at it and you go, this is just really a problem area. Mm -hmm. And I mean, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna establish these standards in areas where we can do something, but there's places we just can't. I I think Second. Is a, is a very good example of an area that's just really difficult to deal with. So, but Grant, nothing would, short of a home fire, nothing's going to trigger that other than an improvement district, which would be kind of hard because there's no waivers on second. So right. you can bet everyone in that street is going to vote no. Yeah. So those kind of ones are dealt with just because they don't really trigger any change at right. this time right um but but like yvonne Dietering's house is on second that burnt right and if you change this you would have some way for her insurance or whoever is helping her rebuild to meet the setbacks and all the stuff but apply for a fee in lieu of actually putting a sidewalk where none of her neighbors have one it's kind of what we're talking about proposing right I saw a thumbs up from Councillor Allen, and I saw a thumbs up from Councillor Webb, and now Councillor Williams. And I, I also give a thumbs up 
I, I would like to have um, some feedback from Ruben on, on the legality of the uh, improvements included in the mortgage. Um, status. So okay. um, I, I'm willing to move forward into another workshop in the direction of uh, tear the bandaid off and move forward. Oh. Okay. And then some exemptions that would be allowed yeah. for fee and lieu. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. And maybe Ruben can help us with those too. Yeah. Okay. Anything, anything else? I, uh, Councillor Allen. Uh, Joe said, let's just say we pass this in a month or two or whatever. Can we just pull those remonstrants up there on Louisiana and say, no, nope, you're putting them in now? Yeah, so you'd go through the formal process of the L developing an LID, which okay. is, there's an or we have an ordinance that tells us what the process is. And then all of those people that signed waivers would participate. They'd be they forced can, to participate. They, and they cannot vote no, right? Right. So, so potentially in the next five years, you could have all those side streets and Louisiana North South, if we got the money we proposed to get for it, right, with the state. Um, you could have that actually look like Nickerson or Roseview Heights or any of the other ones with um, sidewalks and streets. Dale. Not that you'd want the dip from Nickerson, Dale. I saw the eyes. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead, Dale. <laughs> um, and once we change this, there'd be no more waivers as the developer's okay. building. He would just know up front he's going to be putting this in. So, um, yeah. yeah, I think he's already starting to sell some of those houses up there. Yeah, the end, so. I think two are sold. Yeah. So we got to get in, got to get ahead of this. Councilor, go ahead, Grant. I'm just looking for a short answer. Is has there been a, a solution arrived at for the uh, the swampy area there on the on the east side of Louisiana? No. So the where there's a wetland down by C Street. Yeah. Yeah. No. So that would be when someone comes to develop, they would have to do wetland mitigation or build on the portion of property that doesn't have a wetland. So that Is would that just happen as part of development. But the street had a problem. I thought realigning the street had a problem. Yeah. D does it get to a point where where uh, that rises to a level where it where it's able to drain off, or does it just is it just always full of water? It drains. It does drain. Okay. Yeah, and there's not there's not a wetland in Louisiana. There's one to the west. It's to oh, the okay. it's to I the thought west. Robert Ford stated the potential of a wetland. It's a smidge in Louisiana Avenue, but mostly in Oregon Avenue. Okay. Yeah. We could work around it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, you would have to address it in the plan. Yeah. Go ahead, Dale. Uh, yeah, talking Here. over you anyhow. But, um, I noticed in Robert's narrative, we were talking about going down E Street with some drainage and that there was talk of already some drainage being there. I'll walk that today. I don't see that drainage anywhere in there. There is. At the cross street of, I think, East, then there's drainage. Um, so. Yeah, uh, and that would be double just from the GIS system plan that I have for the stormwater, which from my understanding isn't complete. There was some stormwater infrastructure in there. So, and part of that up there, so that, that draw that goes in behind the swords place and, and, I uh, 
daughter-in-law that, that draw that comes down and then that it comes down in front of that new manufactured home that just got put in that looks very, very nice sitting in there uh they put in a nice size culvert that's where the water comes down that draw and that there is a there is a pond along our street that must be connecting that east street right at east street and e street i think it is that intersection there is storm drainage there and it comes and out and comes right there where that guy's new culvert is yeah so e has it and then there's there's also storm drainage at the bottom of the hill at C. At C. Oh, further down. Further down, yeah. But yeah. it's at the corner of my fence. Say that again. Yeah, and then it's at the corner of my fence. That's where you're on, your, on your side. It breaks towards, yeah, some of it breaks towards Stephanie. Yeah. The only other thing, and I think it's probably pretty insignificant in the scheme of things but where we're on top of the ridge there the more water we put to stephanie's side is less water that floods through town in an event so you can, we can only put so much on stephanie though but, <laughs> but it is the downstream side so we should prefer to go that way most of the progress well, so the flip side out. the flip side is you could tie in to the school, the round, the round containment pond at the school. When you go around the bus loop, you've seen that sunken containment pond with the weird drain on it. It's like got a cap drain. Looks like a helmet. Yeah. And then that takes that down and down Riverside across and out. Yeah, that'd be a that'd be a tough way to get over to there that's quite, i'm just quite saying a, so the stuff doesn't bank towards stephanie and is below but not banking towards town oh you know what i'm saying because that's that's all in there right off um what do you call it so it'd be right <laughs> off mine's loading so there's a pretty wicked awesome ditch system behind my property and it goes all the way down along our property borders and ends up at the rivers, Riverside uh, Pond and then goes to the Halem. So there is a pretty substantial drainage system already in place. Yeah. yeah. Dale, is that where you and I walked that one day? We went down, we... Down Oregon? And Stephanie's corner, and we walked up along her fence. Yeah, but it's down to the left behind her fence, and where it drains off. It's a natural topography. Yeah, it's yeah. a natural drainage. So. Okay, well, pretty good, really good workshop. I think a lot of a lot of discussion and and changing of the minds and. <laughs> uh i think we're really headed in the right direction personally so it's a little bit past eight o'clock and i want to thank robert for attending this meeting and, and helping us out here and staff and those in attendance tonight from the council thank you very much for being here tonight and uh so i will adjourn the workshop meeting at 8 05 p.m good night all good night everybody <laughs>